Biden administration can do to forward reproductive health and rights around the globe. Uh, the Trump administration has, for the last four years, pretty viciously attacked international human rights, particularly sexual and reproductive health and rights. Now, as we look toward a Biden and Harris administration, it's important to not only undo the innumerable harms wrought by the Trump administration's policies, but to truly, as Biden promises, build back better with a progressive agenda to ensure that all people can realize their sexual and reproductive rights. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with these three experts and justice warriors, as well as with all of you about what needs to happen, why, and how we can realize this feminist vision. So I will let Sarah, Akila, and Anu introduce themselves and offer just a brief description of their various organizations, missions, and visions. And I guess we'll start with Sarah. Thank you, Jill. Um, so good to be with you, Anu and Akila, as well. Happy Human Rights Day, everyone. I'm Sarah Sipple. I'm president of CHANGE, the Center for Health and Gender Equity. And CHANGE is a US-based human rights organization that advocates for the development and implementation of US policies that advance health and rights of people, women and girls, and others who are discriminated against. We started more than 25 years ago in 1994 at the International Conference on Population and Development, where the US government joined the global consensus to support universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. We were founded at that time by two American women who were there, who were at the conference, and who were told by our partners uh, in the Global South from the global feminist movement, now go take of your, care of your own goddamn government. So. That's why we're here in Washington, D.C. We're doing exactly that, holding the U.S. government accountable to that commitment and subsequent commitments to the global sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda. Um, and I'm just delighted to be here uh, with Jill and my colleagues, Anu and Akila, to talk about uh, what we can really expect from and what we want from the Biden administration when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So thank you. Uh, Akila, do you want to go next? Sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jill. And, and thanks, Sarah and Anu, just echoing everyone's, you know, that it, it's so great that we're able to have this conversation. So I'm just really excited that we're in a place of where we're looking forward. So I'm Akila Radhakrishnan. I'm the president of the Global Justice Center. We're an international human rights organization dedicated to advancing gender equality through the rule of law. Um, in our work, we combine legal analysis with strategic advocacy to ensure equal protection of the law for women and girls in particular with a focus on sexual and reproductive rights, as well as on justice for sexual and gender-based violence in context of mass atrocities and conflict. So really looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you. I presume I'm next. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jill, Sarah, and Akila for inviting me into this conversation. It's really, I'm excited to be here. I'm Anu Kumar. I am president and CEO of IPASS. IPASS is a 47-year-old organization that focuses on access to abortion and contraception around the world. Um, we, are, we operate in three main ways. We work with health systems to make sure that health, government health systems, public health systems are able to provide access to abortion and contraception. We work on policy and advocacy with my colleagues here and many others around the world uh, to ensure that laws and regulations and policies are supportive of women's uh, access to safe abortion and contraception. And we also work with a range of community organizations to essentially work on changing gender and social norms around these issues. So those are our three main pillars of work. And, and as I mentioned, we work primarily in the global south. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Um, so as a baseline, I imagine folks in the sexual and reproductive health and rights community are expecting that Biden will at the very, very least undo some of the biggest harms or all of the, all of the biggest harms that the Trump administration has wrought. Um, and Akila, I wanna start with you. Can you outline for us, what are some of those harms that on day one Biden should set about addressing? I am muted. Here we go. So, you know, a part of that that comes to mind is I don't know where we start and how much time we have for this, but I guess I guess we'll go over some of the low lights and we can get into the the details of what some of those are through the discussion. So, 
as Sarah mentioned, today's International Human Rights Day. And it's thankfully the last one that we'll celebrate under this administration, who's really done everything within their power to undermine human rights and the human rights framework, especially protections from marginalized groups, women, LGBTQI individuals, people of color, immigrants. And so for me, the way that, you know, we've really been looking at the Trump administration's approach to human rights is that we need to look at it in two categories, disengagement and erosion. So on the first, on disengagement, there's no question that over the last four years, we've seen the U.S. step away from traditional areas of U.S. engagement and leadership. And in some cases, such as the Human Rights Council and the World Health Organization, explicitly withdraw from multilateral institutions. In lieu of working cooperatively and constructively within consensus bodies and with experts, the U.S. has decided to withdraw from those that we dislike and instead pursued partnerships with regressive governments and coalitions of its own creation. And the other half of this coin has been the active erosion of the human rights framework. So Jill, as you mentioned, from the start, the Trump administration has zealously pursued the dismantling of rights related to gender equality, in particular sexual reproductive rights, and especially access to abortion. These efforts have ranged from the reinstatement and the expansion of the global gag rule on day three of the administration, the implementation of the domestic gag rule, the rigorous and often incorrect enforcement of abortion restrictions on foreign assistance, like the Helms and Sillinger amendments, and the joining forces with regressive governments to oppose advancements in sexual and reproductive health and rights in the international fora, for example, for victims of sexual violence and conflict and through the so-called Geneva Consensus. I know we're gonna unpack a lot of these through the conversation, so I'm just throwing a lot of things out there. And I think I'll just conclude by talking about the fact that this has been paralleled by a larger effort to erode the modern human rights framework, which can perhaps best be seen in Secretary of State Pompeo's dangerous and illegal Commission on Unalienable Rights, which has tried to limit and redefine international human rights in a very American way roll back and limit the hard-won protections under that framework for sexual and reproductive rights, the rights of LGBTQI persons, and create a false hierarchy of human rights that elevates religious liberty and the right to property over all other rights. And so I think, you know, to go back to the framing of the conversation, there's certainly a whole lot to undo, but I think as we'll also talk about today, it's just as important that we prioritize the need to fundamentally shift the United States' approach to human rights its role in the world and its role in multilateral institutions and make that one an approach that's grounded in feminism and intersectionality is inclusive, anti-racist and anti-colonial. So I'll stop there. Great, um, that was fairly comprehensive, but Anu, I wanna ask you, is there anything else that uh, is on your list of sort of an immediate harm that the Biden administration needs to undo? You're muted, Ani. So as I've been saying, that's the, the hashtag for 2020. You're on mute. Um, so yes, as Akila said, definitely there is um, a need to, you know, uh, restore some of our the United States' uh, standing in the international stage. Uh, the, the, under this administration, the United States has essentially doubled down on an anti-rights, anti-abortion, and anti-women positions. Um, I think it's really important to pick up on a few things that Akila mentioned. So it's not just a withdrawal from multilateralism, which is definitely there and a huge problem. So the withdrawal from agencies like the World Health Organizations during a global pandemic, the withdrawal from UNFPA, the lead agency on population and family planning and reproductive health work, um, early on in the administration is very significant. Exiting bodies like the Human Rights Council, extremely important and, uh, and really a signal to how this administration has felt about human rights all along. In addition, the Trump administration has kept um, company with countries like Poland and Hungary that are all similarly moving away from human rights commitments. Um, and so that's really bad. It's really bad for gender equality, for sexual and reproductive health and rights, for LGBTQI rights. Um, and I, so I think, you know, I think there is, there is that kind of need to get back into the multilateral space. But importantly, the Trump administration through Pompeo and this commission is creating an alternative multilateral framework. 
And this is something that we really must keep our eyes on because this alternative framework is anti-rights. Uh, and it is likely to continue beyond the term of uh, President Trump. Uh, so I think that's something to, to keep in mind that we really need to, to focus on. And of course, in terms of immediate gains, and, and I know that Sarah is going to talk about this more, you know, we are looking forward to a repeal of the global gag rule. At, but then we must, of course, go much further. And, and I'd be happy to talk about this more uh, later. We must uh, actually also talk about the Helms Amendment, which is still here, still present, 47 years of IPASS, is in parallel track with 47 years of the Helms Amendment. Um, so I hope we can come back and talk about that. Great, thank you. Uh, and Sarah, anything else that we haven't touched on that's on your list of Trump administration harms that need to be undone? Yeah, unbelievably, or believably, <laughs> I have much more to add, um, but I'll try to keep it short. I mean, this just shares, I mean, the, the list just goes on and on, and I think the Biden administration really has their work cut out for them. So a profound harm of the Trump administration that I worry may get the least attention is the undoing of progress on sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender inequality in, equality in our U.S. Uh, foreign aid and policy. Every single year of this presidency, the Trump administration has chipped away at the U.S. government's global commitments to sexual reproductive health and rights. They have been relentless in their efforts. And Trump went so far, uh, the administration went so far as trying to strip the words, the term sexual reproductive health and rights from our foreign policy lexicon. So just a few kind of brief examples. Um, the U.S. as um, as, as Akila and Anu noted, the U.S. has joined with other authoritarian countries like Hungary, Saudi Arabia, Brazil at UN meetings, at meetings of the United Nations, at the World Health Organization, coming together to, with a singular focus of stripping any language that mentions sexual and reproductive health, gender equality, women's empowerment, to strip this language out of any official communiques, agreements, or declarations, the State Department even sought to ban U.S. diplomats from using the term reproductive health at the U.N. And uh, the security and at the Security Council meeting, the Trump administration threatened to veto a resolution condemning conflict related sexual violence because it mentioned women's reproductive health services. Um, so, again, the, the, this administration has been just relentless and unabashed in and their agenda to completely undo sexual reproductive health and rights. And language makes a difference. Um, you know, a lot of people ask, well, what does it really it make a difference if, if these words are in these documents? Do these documents have meaning? Yes, these documents have meaning. They're used by advocates and also other countries to help guide and, and formulate their policies. Um, so language does make a difference. And that's why the Obama administration took steps to adopt the term sexual and reproductive health and rights. It does have practical implications for U.S. foreign policy and assistance, allowing the U.S. to allocate funding for pressing sexual and reproductive health needs. And I think Secretary Pompeo and Vice President Pence know that, and that's why they are so dogged in efforts to remove that language in any kind of foreign policy situation. And we're suffering consequences as a nation. I would say this has meant U.S. our allies have left us behind on the on the national stage. We're no longer uh, sought after for as a leader or even for a partnership on these issues. So I think that's why it's really important that on day one that Biden, the Biden administration formally um, recognizes, announces that the U.S. government does indeed support the global community, the global consensus and supporting universal access to sexual reproductive health and rights. Wonderful. Um, so that's a nice segue to my next question. Um, so I want to know, and I'm, I'm sure many people watching are, are very curious about this question. Um, what can Biden do on day one by executive order? Doesn't need the approval of Congress, uh, can just sign the sheet. Um, what falls into that bucket that sexual and reproductive health and rights advocates would like to see? Um, what can Biden signal via his appointments. What are the big appointments that we should be watching for? Um, you know, perhaps who would we like to see in some of those slots? 
Uh, and then what does he need Congress to do? You know, assuming that depending on how Georgia goes, uh, we may still have a Republican dominated Senate and he may have to prioritize where and how he spends his political capital. How do we want him to spend it? So I'd love to hear about those three buckets and then to add kind of the second layer to it was already a big question. Um, what can Biden do that would sort of restore us to where we were in 2016? And within those three buckets, executive orders, appointments, legislation, um, how do we expect him to actually build on where we were? So not just returning us to the days of Obama, but moving us forward. What can he do? What do we expect? Um, and Sarah, I'm gonna go to you first. Thanks, Joe. Oh, wait. oh I am trying to make some. Sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you, Jill. So I, I'll start with in terms of day one actions that Biden can and should take. Uh, first, given the global COVID pandemic on day one, the U.S. should be joined the World Health Organization, engage with them on our domestic and global COVID response and other health matters, of course, sexual reproductive health matters. Um, and given the climate crisis that has been exacerbated by Trump, Biden should re-engage in the Paris Agreement. But another important day one action is within the global gag rule. This is something that is within the power of the president. Um, so, and I'll say a bit about what it is first. Um, as one of, of one of his first actions, President Trump reinstated and expanded the Mexico City policy, also known as the global gag rule, and renamed by the Trump administration as the protecting life and global health assistance policy. So it has nothing to do about protecting life. This policy prevents foreign organizations receiving US global health assistance from providing information, referrals, or services for legal abortion or advocating for changes to abortion law in their country, even with their own non-US money. So when in place under previous Republican administration, the policy applied only to international family planning assistance. And this is important because Trump's version of the policy extends the requirements to global health assistance furnished by all departments or agencies. So it's much more expansive. Trump reintroduced and expanded this policy even in the face of public health evidence of its detrimental harms to the health and rights of women and girls. We had data from previous global gag rules from previous Republican administrations of the harms that it did. And just despite that evidence, they went ahead and not only reinstated it, but expanded it. And given the numerous expansions of the policy over the course of the Trump administration, the policy continues to impact programs across US global health assistance from PEPFAR, which is our global AIDS programming to nutrition programming, maternal health, family planning. The impacts of the policy range from an increase in abortion, breakdowns in integrated health services, loss of contraceptive and HIV prevention services to death. So we know that Biden will rescind this horrible policy that has no good purpose in, in this world. So, and it's something that other Democratic presidents have done. This time, however, due to the extensive harm of Trump's version, we expect, we want, we're asking for a bolder uh, action, like a new executive order. This executive order would explicitly state support for sexual and reproductive health and rights in foreign policy and also domestic policy, bringing together the US policies that impact women and girls and others in the US and overseas. It would rescind the global gag rule. It would reverse harmful domestic abortion restrictions, condemn hide and helms, which are the laws that ban US funding for abortions at home and overseas. And I, I hope, I know Anu will say more about those and clarifies that US funding can be used for abortion overseas in the cases of rape, incest, and life endangerment. That is allowable by US law. So I know it's a bold ask for such an executive order, but frankly, women deserve it, especially after these past four years. Um, but I wanna be clear, rescinding the global gag rule is the floor, it's not the ceiling. Once a global gag rule is rescinded, we'll need Biden administration to take further action, issue directives to agencies, US admissions, and, and other um, agencies to uh, our implementing partners that the policy is gone. And the Biden administration will need to expedite revising USAID, CDDC, and all the agencies um, that are responsible for implementing the policy, for, to work with them, to get them to change their provisions, contract language as soon as possible. Um, this can take a long time. And so, but we need to, 
we need the administration to be on high alert to get this out of our policy. Um, and finally, important to remember that Biden cannot end the global gag rule for good. Uh, only Congress can do that. So to prevent the policy from coming back again in four or eight years or whenever, whenever there's a next Republican administration, Biden uh, should champion and support the Global Her Act in Congress to help get that legislation through so that there is a permanent repeal of the gag rule. Fantastic, thank you, Sarah. Um, Anu, I wanna go to you next. Talk to me about these three buckets of what Biden can do. Um, and I would love to hear from you a little bit about the Helms Amendment, which I know Sarah touched on. So if you could explain what Helms is uh, and what Biden can potentially do around Helms uh, and the US approach to reproductive rights and health generally. Sure, thank you. Right, so what is the Helms Amendment? The Helms Amendment uh, is an amendment to the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act. Uh, it was introduced by former Senator Jesse Helms from my home state of North Carolina. Uh, and it is an amendment that frankly reeks of sort of imperialism, colonialism, and overt racism. Um, even the Nixon administration, when this amendment was originally proposed, opposed the policy. Uh, so Trump hasn't touched this policy because it's been in place for 47 years at this point. And he did expand the gag rule, as Sarah has noted. But um, he has done nothing, obviously, to, to change either Helms or, the, or and has expanded the gag rule. So what can Biden do? Um, you know, Biden can, as Sarah mentioned, put this in an executive order to instruct the U.S. government to uh, follow the full extent of the law, of the existing law, which does permit abortion, U.S. Assistant funds, assistance funds to be used for provision of abortion care instances of rape, uh, 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 rape and, and when li and the life of the mother is in danger. Um, so, it is, uh, it, you know, the way that we've interpreted it so far for these past 47 years has been as a total ban on the use of U.S. foreign assistance funds for abortion care. And what that has meant is that abortion is then separated from the continuum of reproductive health care that women need and, and deserve. And not just, um, you know, all women. The Helms Amendment particularly targets black and brown women in low and middle income countries, which is why I contend that it is a racist policy. Um, and I wanna just remind us that our foreign assistance, the US foreign assistance is supposed to promote global health, peace, economic security, social development, humanitarian assistance. It is not meant to be uh, driven by ideological motivations uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and actually hamper the provision of humanitarian aid. So on January 21st, uh, Biden must signal his commitment to making abortion care available to women overseas uh, by his administration, by calling for a repeal of the gag rule, by asking for Helms to be uh, implemented to the full extent of, of the law, uh, and then commit U.S. foreign assistance for what is permitted currently under U.S. law: abortion in case for abortion in cases of rape, incest, or threat of the to a woman's life, as well as information and counseling on abortion. So I want to remind us that none of that is happening right now with U.S. funds. Um, so you know it's it's kind of a big deal. Um, but and and just to put it in context, you know, we talk about this about the financial impact, and the financial impact is is real. Um, the gag rule, as Sarah mentioned, the expanded version of the Trump administration's gag rule, impacts all uh, health assistance, all assistance. Uh, and so that's something like twelve billion dollars in aid. The the Helms am amendment affects all funding from the U.S. government. So that's forty billion dollars, approximately, in U.S. funding for governments, for NGOs, for humanitarian relief efforts, et cetera. Now, of course, that is totally dwarfed by the Defense Department budget of $740 billion. And you know, so ultimately, this isn't really about the money. It's about the um, signal that this sends about the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration. After all, only like 1% of the US's entire federal budget is spent on foreign aid. And, any, and of that, a very small fraction goes to healthcare. But the impact of this policy is huge and it affects millions of women in the world's poorest countries. Great, thank you. Um, 
Akila, I want to go to you with the same question. What can what can Biden do himself? What will his appointment signal? What legislation should he really prioritize? Great, thanks. So, you know, as a lawyer, we look at where people have power and the president's like area of most discretion and power is within foreign affairs and within foreign policy. So there is a range of things that the president has the ability to do without this conversation about Congress. I know we absolutely have to grapple with what needs legislative support. And so I think as we're talking about what we want Biden to signal, what I want to see from a Biden-Harris administration is a signal that, that feminism is something that matters, is something that they are going to actually integrate into their thinking of how they carry out their foreign policy. And so, of course, that has to do with what is the U.S. going to do? How are they going to approach fundamental issues related to gender equality, like access to abortion? How are they going to shift that framework? It also relates to how is the U.S. going to use a feminist approach to approach climate change, to approach you know, global nuclear disarmament. There's a range of issues that feminism can help us think about that are all interconnected. Um, and there are impacts on women and girls and on other marginalized populations in all of these arenas. So I think that's the first thing I'd like to see is a signal that it's not just about these one-off commitments to undo the gag rule, but there is something at the core that is going to drive the way that they look at their approach to foreign policy. And I think this is where, when we talk about, you asked about appointments, right? So, you know, there's been a lot of great kind of diversity that we've seen in the appointments that they're currently making. And so I think that that's important. Representation matters, but we also need to think about then what does this mean substantively? Because not only do we want people, because people bring the experiences that they have to the table. So this is where having diverse individuals is an incredibly important pursuit, but it is not one that is going to get us to policies that are inherently anti-racist or inherently feminist. And so what it means in the context of feminism, for example, is that the appointees that we're talking about, those high level, those mid-level, I'd like to see the Biden administration prioritize gender expertise, which looks very different than being a woman, to actually say that this is something that we want to see in the people that we are appointing, because it is that expertise that's going to help make sure that when the U.S. is engaging at the United Nations on a particular issue, that they're actually able to then integrate feminist and gender considerations in the approaches. And so I think that, you know, for me, where this begins is in, is in the big picture, right? Because it's very easy to get bogged down in individual pieces of legislation or policy. But what I want to see is, that, and, and this requires, by the way, a fundamental shift, right? This is not, this is not what, how the Obama administration or any other democratic administration has really approached foreign policy. And so I think that that's where I would say we need to start. And I'm happy to talk about, you know, where that could lead to in more, in more detailed areas as well. Great. Um, <clears throat> Akila, I'm going to come back to you with, with this next question first. Um, so uh, we know, obviously, not, <laughs> not every woman is a feminist, as, as you said. Not even every liberal-minded person is a feminist. And the sexual and reproductive health community has been... Um, certainly disappointed at times, even by democratic presidents and administrations in the past. So I wanna hear from you in, you know, over the next four years, where are there going to be challenges for the sexual and reproductive health and rights community? Where are there opportunities? Uh, and where do the challenges and opportunities also lie for the Biden administration? Sure. So that, that's a big question. So I'll start in a couple, a couple places. So one, I think, and Anu really hinted towards this, we've accepted things like the Helms Amendment. We've accepted things like the Siljander Amendment as the status quo, right? There's never really been a movement to say that when we look at foreign appropriations on an annual basis, what are the opportunities to actually get rid of these policies that have caused so much harm around the world? So I think that, you know, we need that this requires us to be inquiring. And I know there's legislation that Sarah can talk about as well in, in repealing Helms. And this is, this is great progress because for 47 years, 
the conversation within the within the executive office within within Congress has been, but there's no there's no possibility for the U.S. to use its taxpayer money to fund abortions, and therefore there's no way we can pass any legislation that doesn't include these restrictions. So I think that you know it's not just about the the repealing them; it's the fact that that conversation that the the status quo of that conversation has to change. Um, I'd also, I think there, and then I think the other place where there's great opportunities is, you know, I, we're not an organization that focuses solely on the United States. We're an organization that works in a range of countries and thinking about how to use this international framework to help improve domestic systems. Um, and I think one area where I think there's real potential is for, and this is, this is a big uphill battle, is for the Biden administration to think about what it means for us to ratify treaties like the Convention on the Elimination of Discri All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, I'm gonna say it once because it's just, it, it's a bit of a mouthful. The US is one of seven countries that hasn't ratified it. It's the International Bill of Rights on Women. And you know, I think that one of the, it's, it's really important that we think about what are these frameworks that are missing that can actually help the United States improve its approach, both domestically and internationally. So with CEDAW, I'll just say a few things because it's one of my pet topics. And we've actually seen the Biden-Harris administration say that it's one of the things that's within their list of foreign policy priorities. So the US has always kind of been a bad actor when it comes to international human rights. We see international human rights as for the other. We do not see it for ourselves because we think that we are already perfect. So in fact, actually in, in the year, in 2002, when CEDAW was up for consideration in the Senate, Biden wrote an op-ed with Barbara Boxer. And in the op-ed, they say very clearly, we should ratify CEDAW because CEDAW would not require the United States to change any of its laws. We're good. We need to do it for the women in Somalia, in Afghanistan. And it is such a colonial, perspective. It's such a perspective that really disregards the dire state of women's rights here in the United States. And it's one that I think informs not just the approach of, of you know, President-elect Biden, but one of many, many American leaders. And so I think that, you know, when we think about CEDAW, I think, yes, what I want to see is I want to see the Biden-Harris administration set a new framework to say, yes, we want to ratify CEDAW, but we want to ratify it because we want that framework to help improve the system here in the United States. And we also need to step away from really regressive viewpoints that, again, um, President-elect Biden has put forward, including uh, or accepted, including that CEDAW is abortion neutral. CEDAW is not abortion neutral. The un and we wanted to put a formal declaration that says that the United States, if we were to ratify CEDAW, we would only do it on the understanding that CEDAW is abortion neutral. That is harmful for women here. It is harmful for women around the world and anyone else who may need access to abortion. And so I think that, you know, for me, I keep going back to these big structural things because it's, the, it's, it's, what, it's what drives the way that I think that the United States needs to fundamentally build back better. We cannot go back to the arrogance with which the U.S. government has consistently approached its place in the multilateral system in the U.S., you know, within the international space. I think we need to approach with humbleness and say, we're here to be a good member of this larger community. Learn from each other, by the way, because there's a lot that the United States can learn from women's movements around the world, from other countries that have gone so much further as well. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Sarah, I wanna come to you next. What do you see as opportunities in the next four years for sexual health and reproductive rights? Um, and where do you see barriers, challenges, potential landmines? Yeah. Well, landmines is definitely on my mind um, because we know the Trump administration will likely leave landmines and policy personnel or both. So we can't even fully identify yet all the challenges the new administration and those of us advocating will be facing. So that is still to be told in terms of the challenges that we're faced with. Um, but I think that's also why we're, we really need to urge the Biden-Harris administration to be proactive um, in really taking bold steps forward um, on these issues. 
Um, another thing that this administration can do that would be really important would be removing policies that allowed for and supported discrimination against LGBTQ persons in our foreign aid pro programs. We need to remove special exemptions to faith-based groups that give them the green light for discrimination. Will the Biden administration do that? I don't know. This is always this, the faith, this whole issue around faith-based groups and they're getting preference and which they have a reach, they have a role, they're very important in our foreign assistance, um, and, but we should not be holding them to a different standard than we do to any other nonprofit, NGO, non-governmental organization, that we should hold them to the highest standards of public health, human rights, and good practice. Um, but it's not only the harm of the Trump administration's anti-woman, anti-human rights agenda that we need to repair. Um, we need to address the decades of neocolonial and racist laws and policies that we've been talking about that have hampered foreign aid and policy and have deterred progress in the countries that we purport to, to be assisting. Um, so I think one thing that Biden can do in that area in terms of um, on, on racism is, you know, reverse the Trump's outrageous and harmful executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping. Um, it was outrageous and needs to go. And I think that's we shouldn't forget the, there are so many of these actions I know that are, we don't necessarily see as connected to foreign policy or sexual reproductive health and rights, but they absolutely are. Um, I think Biden can lead the way in pushing back on this false division between domestic and foreign policy. It's the same policymakers, the same people who make policy to help women and girls and others in the US are the same people making policies that impact people overseas. So I think in order to dismantle this neocolonial and racist tendencies in our foreign aid, we need to connect the domestic and foreign policy making. Um, and also, and that goes for us who are the advocates because we're, we, ha, we, we follow this division too. And um, I think we can be much stronger, much more effective for the people who we say we're trying to help um, by working together and getting the US to be, have a unified um, you know, agenda and policy to, to improve people's lives and help them thrive. Um, I think the blueprint for sexual and reproductive health and rights and justice is an important piece of work. I think they're already, um, that those of us on this, in, on this panel are a part of, and with some 90, I think we're up to 90 organizations and advocates who are advocating on sexual reproductive health and rights and reproductive justice in the US domestic policy and foreign policy, but we're really coming together with this blueprint with some first days asked to really outline, this is what we expect and want from this administration. Um, I'm hopeful because even the, the depth, how the blueprint is framing sexual reproductive health and rights comes from the Guttmacher Lancet Commission definition that was launched in 2018. Um, and that this is not just for foreign policy, this is also for domestic policy too. Um, we need to make our foreign aid programs inclusive and center the lives of those who face stigma and discrimination. And so I don't know, how about creating a strategy to ensure that US overseas sexual reproductive health and rights programs and those domestically too, um, are inclusive and meet the needs of women and girls who face stigma and discrimination, those with disabilities, LGBTQ persons, gender non-conforming women and girls, sex workers, adolescents, women and girls living with HIV, unmarried individuals, so that we put people at the center, who is suffering the most, who is suffering from the most oppressions, forms of discrimination, and put them in the front and center of our front. So does this policy meet this, this person's needs? Um, if it doesn't, then we need to go back to the, to the, to the drawing board. Um, and I think this is true for advocates as well as the Biden administration, that we all need to hold ourselves accountable um, and center people. And because I can sit in Washington, D.C., where I sit and think that I'm coming up with the most creative, best policy solutions. But if I talk to my colleagues in, in Kenya or Mozambique, wherever, they might say, Sarah, no, that's not what we need. And so that's, we, we need our partners to hold us accountable. We need to hold the administration accountable. Um, and I think that's a really big challenge that we're facing when we're thinking about totally revamping um, and re recreating, rebuilding our U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Anu, I'm gonna send it over to you. Okay. Biggest opportunities, biggest potential challenges. 
So the biggest opportunity is uh, this legislation that's been alluded to. Uh, we have uh, legislation that was introduced. Several, pe actually, the, the the one that I'm talking about is the, the repeal of the Helms Amendment, which is, as Akila noted, the first time that a piece of legislation has ever been introduced to repeal the Helms Amendment. It's in its 47 years of existence. The Helms Amendment is so much part of our background. It's like part of the wallpaper. We don't even think about it. Uh, the media doesn't cover it because they also have um, normalized it in a sense. And so, um, you know, to have legislation now that actually calls for not reinterpretation, not interpretation of the existing amendment, but repeal of the Helms Amendment is incredibly important and significant and a huge opportunity uh, in front of Congress uh, for this administration. So, so that uh, to me is a, a, a really major opportunity. The HER uh, Act is also significant to finally get the political football, that's the global gag rule, out of the field. You know, just stop talking about it and let's just get on with it um, and not look to this every four year kind of cyclical change that occurs. Uh, and that, that has real consequences. This is not just politics. It has real ramifications for the lives of women and girls living around the world. So, you know, our politics, our ideology has a direct impact on the lives of, of individuals around the world. So I think those are two huge opportunities. Um, the, the other opportunities are um, perhaps less visible to the American public, but, um, you know, the opportunity the U.S. government now has to negotiate, to talk with, to be a part of international consortia and donor-led ac activities is huge. So, you know, essentially the Trump administration has kind of been a pariah from uh, the, the donors that support a progressive vision of sexual and reproductive health and rights. The Biden-Harris administration would be warmly welcomed back into the fold. Uh, and this is important. And this is an opportunity to leverage huge amounts of resources and goodwill in the global community. Um, so, and, and, and you know, Akila mentioned that we need to have kind of a, a feminist vision for our foreign policy. I entirely agree. And I want to remind us that that is not a new idea. There are countries that actually do this. Um, you know, Sweden, Canada, New Zealand, uh, many, many countries have embraced and actually implemented a feminist vision to not just foreign policy, but to governing. Um, and so this you know, this is again another another opportunity for us, and then and then I think the final thing that I would mention in terms of opportunity is this, uh, you know, return to multilateralism and multilateral organizations. You know, I mean, to be to be quite, um, you know clear about it, you know, the withdrawal from the World Health Organization at a time when this country, like every other country, needs a global vaccine seemed incredibly um, foolish. So, you know, the, the opportunity to go back to the World Health Organization to benefit from their learning for our citizens is uh, a huge opportunity for Americans, but then also, you know, other international organizations like UNFPA and, and others who have a really important role in the global um, in the global system of multilateralism. So, you know, those are some of the immediate opportunities. And I do want to make just one point around appointments. You mentioned appointments before, Jill, and it is really important to think about who's going to be in charge. Yeah, you know, we're, we've been focused a lot on Congress and, and Biden-Harris, but Biden-Harris can make appointments, for example, in the State Department. That would make a huge difference, you know. And what we've heard so far is the nominee is uh, publicly supportive of reproductive rights. Um, and so we'll see, you know, we'll see how that translates into actual action and policy. And of course, that's our job as advocates is to hold uh, hold them accountable. Um, so there's a lot to be done. And, and, and I know there's questions around previous, uh, previous administrations, which we'd be also be happy to talk about. Great. Uh, I have one last question, but for anyone who is tuning in, if you have a question you would like to submit to the panelists, you can add it right into the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can before the hour is up. Um, but Anu, you mentioned uh, this term feminist foreign policy and feminist governance. I'm going to ask you a really big question and then do the obnoxious thing of making you all answer it in a really short time frame. So can everyone give me like one or two sentences? What does it look like to realize feminist foreign policy and feminist governance? Um, and Anu, since you raised the term, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> sure. Um, so to me, a feminist foreign policy 
looks like uh, putting uh, women's equality at the center of decision making, uh, whether that's budget decisions, whether that's policy decisions, uh, whether that's uh, appointments and hiring and recruitment. Uh, it's, you know, it's really putting uh, gender equality at the center. Um, so, you know, very practically and for IPASS's world, that means not just repeal of the Helms Amendment, which, you know, so I've gone beyond interpretation and beyond Helms, but squarely putting abortion and abortion care on the continuum of reproductive health care and rights that all people are entitled to. Um, it means upholding international agreements, supporting programs that, that, that integrate reproductive health and, and abortion and contraception. Um, and it, you know, in having programs that actually support gender equality. Um, I know a lot of people think of feminism and the feminist foreign policy as sort of being political, um, but actually support for safe abortion care and, and repeal of Helms, for example, is politically viable. IPAS has done polling on this, and our opinion data and polling show that by a 21-point margin, voters favor overturning the Helms Amendment, and they favor elected leaders who support overturning the amendment. Um, so not only can this be done, it must be done, and that would be the start in my mind, the start of a feminist foreign policy. Fantastic. Akila, I'm going to go to you next. What does realizing your feminist vision look like? I think it looks like coherence because what it means is that if you center feminism, you know, one hand isn't doing something that's undermining the other. So if the US is standing up, let's say, for violence against women, they're not then also implementing a policy like Helms that actually inhibits the ability of victims of violence from accessing the care that they need. You know, it means that if the US is, is concerned about gender equality, that they're not, you know, engaging in selling arms, for example, to countries that are actively engaged in the repression of gender equality, right? So, a feminist vision, an intersectional vision, is one that actually can help make our foreign policy make sense and not have one action, you know, have most things be rhetorical advances, while in reality, we're not actually making any progress. Great. And Sarah, what about you? Thanks, Jill. So I, I want to start by saying this is not a theoretical um, exercise or, or a conversation that there is a proposal out there for a U.S. feminist foreign policy. Um, and you can find it on the website of the International Center for Research on Women. It's been endorsed by over 80 organizations. And it's amazing just the, the, the wide, um, the breadth of, of, of issues that the groups have signed on to. So um, just wanted to flag that. Um, for me, I mean, I want to say two things about a feminist foreign policy. One is um, a, a cabinet that reflects America with gender parity, diversity, and inclusive representation for one. Um, the second is a feminist foreign policy doesn't leave anyone behind. And similar to what I was saying before, um, that a, an administration that em embraces this feminist foreign policy truly listens to and meaningfully engages with the people who are most impacted by US foreign policy. Um, and I would say I would throw in domestic policy too. Um, but since we're talking about foreign policy, um, what, do, what do people need to, to thrive, to survive and thrive in their lives? And that instead of this US government just exporting whatever it thinks and um, you know, what they think the ideas are, the solutions are, and even for us in the advocacy and even implementing partners, that I think that in order, if we truly are committed to feminism, we are committed to dismantling neocolonialism, racism in our foreign policy. And that means we need to really um, flip the power structure, it, it, it reach out to, um, we know who the people are in countries and governments in civil society and other countries and just in a meaningful way, engage them and be ready to respond and be held accountable. And we might, um, and we might um, you know, not get the answers we want, uh, but, and we have to be open to that. But I think that's, that's what feminism is about, is, is really changing the status quo um, and making real change for this world so that everybody thrives. And again, looking at who is the most marginalized in communities, and if they're not thriving, then we're not doing our job. Fantastic. 
Thank you. We've got a couple of great questions in the queue. Um, so I'm going to ask again that these very big questions be answered as briefly as possible. We can get through as many of them as we can. Um, Sarah, I'm going to direct the first one to you, um, which is, can you hear how this administration and the approach of the sexual reproductive health and rights community will be different than under the Obama administration? So my answer to that, how it will be different will depend on, I think, um, I think the ask from the advocacy uh, community, um, how do we, how are we working together? And can we, can we maintain the, the bridges, the connections that we've built over the past four years? So if we want Biden to act differently than Obama acted, then we as advocates have to act differently and we have to have bold asks. I think like the executive order I mentioned, um, that we're not just asking for a presidential memorandum to undo, to rescind the global gag rule. We're asking for a proactive, positive um, reinforcement of U.S. support for universal access to sexual reproductive health and rights. And then we as advocates can take that as a tool to push for um, and hold the agencies accountable. So, um, and, I, and I think, again, this feminist foreign policy, um, really pushing that, it's, it's um, I think we, and I'll say, we will know, I think what Biden does in his first few days, his first actions will be an indication, is it the same or is it different? So I think we all need to be watching that carefully and to see, do we get a presidential memorandum, the same paragraph that Obama <laughs> used was changing the date or do we get something bold and new and different? That's a really useful metric. Thank you. Um, Anu, I want to take the next question to you. Uh, is there any potential that a Biden administration will be helpful in any way to legalize abortion in countries like Bangladesh, where it's currently illegal? And I would love to broaden that question out, not just about Bangladesh, but generally in countries where abortion is outlawed. Um, can the Biden administration be helpful there? Absolutely. Um, so, so first, let me let me say that actually, in the last several decades, last three decades, um, forty countries around the world have actually changed their laws to allow for greater access to abortion. Um, and, you know, so we have seen around the world a huge. Uh, change in abortion access and legality. Um, and some of that has been due to the, the great work, a lot of that has been due to the great work by activists around the world. Um, and the recognition that abortion is a human right and that safe abortion is absolutely essential for protecting people's health and well being. Um, so uh, you know, a lot of that work has been supported by local activism, local, um, uh, you know, uh, feminist movements. Uh, those movements are supported uh, by local donors, but also international donors, including uh, major donor nations. And so this is kind of what I was alluding to in terms of whether the, you know, this administration has the opportunity to work with many other large and small donors to actually uh, shift and change uh, you know, the, the, the conversation around abortion access and, and the legality of abortion. So yes, I do think it has a tremendous opportunity. And I do want to point out that abortion is not illegal in Bangladesh. So um, it is uh, referred to as menstrual regulation in Bangladesh, and it is very much legal and has been since 1974 and has been provided by the government of Bangladesh safely and uh, openly. And in fact, IPAS most recently was involved in the provision of abortion care to Rohingya refugees that fled into Bangladesh from Myanmar. Um, so, uh, you know, so anyway, so the, all that to say that the, that the legal question is, is an important one, but it is not a binary. It's not a legal or illegal. It is uh, more expansive than that. Uh, and in that uh, expansion, I do think that the Biden-Harris administration could be extremely helpful. Jill, can I just say something here, though? Um, I fully agree with Anu on that. I do think that we want, I, I, I want to just raise one of my other pet restrictions, which is the still gender amendment. So in parallel to Helms, you actually have another long accepted provision that says that with US foreign assistance, you cannot lobby for or against abortion. And this provision has actually been utilized to shut down the ability to advocate for legal reform and change. And there's parallel Kind of provisions restricting speech in Helms and in the global gag rule as well. And so I think here it's really important that there are ways 
for us to partner to support those local civil society organizations. But there's also another piece of legislation that I do think we need to prioritize repeal of because this shuts down free advocacy and free speech around the world. Great, thank you. Um, we're running a little close to the end time, um, but there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that touch on sort of one overarching topic that we haven't gotten to yet, which is the culture work issue. So we talked a lot about what the administration can do, what we can do legislatively, um, but you know, in order to make some of these changes more permanent, right, we need both legislation, not just executive orders that can be repealed president to president, but we also need to see kind of the, the ground shift beneath our feet so that there is uh, a more general uh, demand for the, the kind of changes we want to see. Um, so I'll sort of leave it to whoever wants to jump in and, and talk about that. But I would love to hear what can happen uh, on, on the culture front and what should be the priorities. So if I could start. Um... So, you know, I, I've, so I'm an anthropologist, actually, by training, and so I think a lot about culture and cultural change in, in general, and uh, I do agree that, that what we're seeing and talking about here um, is at the policy level is actually deeper rooted, and, and I think, you know, legal norms are also reflective of societal norms, and, you know, laws and policies reflect societal norms. Uh, one thing, certainly about abortion, that I've been really conscious of and worked on for the last many years is the stigma that surrounds abortion, and that stigma is evident in these policies. You know, why is the Helms Amendment? Why does that exist? Why does the gag rule come back again and again? Because of the stigma that surrounds abortion, um, and that stigma is deep, and it's really rooted, I think, in uh, ideas and constructs of female sexuality that we have to unpack and deal with. Uh, you know, about who who is allowed to be a mother? When are they allowed to be a mother? When are they not allowed? When is it not acceptable? Uh, which women can get abortions? Which women can't? Um, so I, you know, I think that is a very uh, important and deep conversation, and part of the work that that we do certainly with community organizations around the world uh, to really think about how, uh, you know, it's not really just about abortion, right? Abortion is an indicator about how gender equality is, uh, is, is in a society, how are women valued, how are girls valued. Uh, and that is why, you know, organizations like ours focus on the issue of abortion because of that indicator. So I, I'm going to stop because I know we're running out of time. Um, any final thoughts from Akila or Sarah before we wrap up? Yeah, I'll just say I, I love the culture question because I think this is where um, we really need creative activism. We need engagement with um, so many of those who are, are part of the culture setting in our, our communities and societies. And just a shout out to, to Jess Jacobs, I know she's on the call, to the wonderful musical on the global gag rule. And I just thought like, how can you create a musical about the global gag rule? It's so awful. Um, and she did it and, and, and you do that. And then you reach so many different people in different ways with a message about, because these policies by design are complicated. They're multi-layered. There's no quick sound bite to talk about Helms or the global gag rule. And so we really do need to engage artists and others um, and, to uh, to really to to help shape the narrative, to tell the narrative, and to to win the hearts and minds. Um, and it's like because we can bring the evidence and the data, and even the human rights arguments to get to people's minds, but we need to get to their hearts. And I think culture change—that's what culture change is all about. Um, and I'll say too, with my background being in religion and theology, that the the role of religion in our culture and shaping our culture, and really lifting up the liberating voices and and perspectives that come from the different religious traditions, I think is really important that, so that no one religious position or person is dictating US policy. And I'll say one of our biggest challenges in that is the US bishops and is Biden gonna listen to the US bishops over women and girls? Um, and, and I guess I'll just kind of, you know, the other thing that I think about, and I guess this has probably been the theme is, is about culturally in the United States. And I think it's one that, you know, we've talked a lot about in how it's manifested in leadership, how the U.S. approaches the rest of the world, how we look at the rest of the world, how we learn from the rest of the world. 
I think there's almost a a lack of imagination sometimes in what we as a feminist movement should be asking for, um, especially those I think who are sitting in leadership levels. I think you know if we're actually listening to the voice of grassroots actors, it's not there. But you know I'm always surprised when I have conversations with my own friends when we talk about an ask of you know we're still stuck in a place of 12 weeks of unpaid maternity leave, right? Where the rest of the world has moved far beyond that and far ahead of us, but we don't think to look outside to see what we can learn and what it is that we can do. And I'm not just talking about Europe. I am talking about countries in Latin America. I am talking about countries in Africa that have you know, significantly more participation of women, 60% in Rwanda than in our government, which is at 20%. And, I, and you know, to me, this is a huge piece of the cultural work is to step out of American exceptionalism. And that goes for leaders, that goes for all of us as everyday citizens and look to the rest of the world and learn from the rest of the world because there is so much that's happened that the United States could benefit from. So instead of just seeing us as some sort of caretaker of the world, right, that defines our foreign policy, that defines the way we think of our assistance, I think it's time to start thinking of ourselves as a citizen of the world. And that means that it's a, it's a two-way street. And that to me is the biggest cultural shift that, that needs to happen at all levels. Fantastic. So we are just about out of time. Um, but I want to thank all three of you, Anu, Akila, Sarah, uh, the Global Justice Center for hosting. It, it feels strange to be having a conversation about opportunities after four years of feeling like all we're trying to do is, you know, patch up <laughs> the holes uh, and, and stop so much wrongdoing. Um, and it feels incredibly heartening to have three incredible experts, leaders, all in the room together talking about what those opportunities are. So thank you to everyone who tuned into the conversation. Um, I, I would imagine that all three of our panelists would be happy to continue it, perhaps over social media. They're all on Twitter. Um, so please, let's, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you for being here today. Uh, and I hope we can all do it again soon. Looking forward to four good years. Thanks thank all. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.